Now, the Archive Hour, Stephen Venables, the mountaineer and writer, looks back to the historic expedition 30 years ago to the day, which put British climbers on top of the world's highest mountain for the first time. The programme opens up the daily audio diary kept by the expedition leader, Chris Bonington, as well as using television documentary soundtrack from those momentous days. The British on top of the world. <laughs> Well, it's very difficult to to imagine actually just what it was like, kind of looking thirty years back, because one was thirty years younger. But um, it was certainly it was the most um, it was the most challenging thing I've ever done in my career. <laughs> Oh, dear, my old friend. Oh, well, I mean, you can't compare Everest with any other mountain. It's the highest mountain in the world, and that sets it apart from all other mountains. Uh, I thought the odds against when we left England were about 90% against, 10% for success. It's the biggest sort of expedition you can possibly be asked on, particularly now, and I don't think there will be many, many, very many more big expeditions. <laughs> You're trying to say that Chris isn't a nice chap? Oh, no, no. <laughs> I mean, Chris would know that. I didn't mean that. I think we all came yeah. thinking, oh, God, we're going to see. We're going to be stuck here uh, with Three rain, weeks, sleet, so. snow coming down. And yet, it's turned out really well, especially on the mountain. I mean, the higher you get up, the better the weather. In seven short weeks in 1975, Chris Bonington was to lead an expedition that would put the first Britons on top of Everest, but also lead to two tragic deaths. Thirty years ago, only 49 people had climbed the world's highest mountain. To reach the summit by any means was still a rare achievement. But the 41-year-old Chris Bonington was aiming not just at the summit, but on getting his team to the top by what was then considered the hardest route the southwest face. This precipice, one and a half miles high, had defeated the cream of world mountaineering talent on five previous occasions. Bonington himself had attempted it in 1972. Now he was back, staking his reputation on this fresh attempt to snatch the glittering prize of high-altitude mountaineering. Luckily, he kept an audio diary during the expedition, a private confessional, which has never been heard in public before. A sign of 25,000 foot living. I just recorded about half an hour of Bon Mers and had forgotten to switch on the ready tank recorder. With a sponsor on board, Chris was able to assemble the 40 tons of equipment needed and have it driven overland in two trucks from Leeds to Nepal. By the 2nd of August, they were ready to begin the 160 miles walk into base camp from Kathmandu. Well, no, 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 I think the approach march um, gives one more of a chance than anything to get really fit. I wouldn't miss it. I mean, I, I, I feel sorry for Martin missing it. Yesterday and today has been really well spent. I think suddenly from the team feeling rather big and unwieldy, everyone was working, everyone was getting on with their own thing and it ceased to seem so big and started feeling a really good rather happy much, unit yeah. on the approach once you ideally want to stay roughly as you were when you left England except a hell of a sight fitter yeah. I think with this kind of food I'll be putting weight on well, I don't know about that ball, against a background of rampant inflation back in Britain questions were even asked in Parliament about the sponsor Barclays Bank spending its shareholders money on a mountaineering jolly even Pete Boardman, the 24-year-old new boy on the climbing team, described a Bonington expedition as the last great imperial experience. The expedition was indeed a large one, with 18 climbers and a hundred or so Sherpa. Organising this leviathan would have been a logistical nightmare to most climbers, but to Chris, a former tank commander, it was an irresistible challenge. After months of exhausting preparation, the walk-in was an enjoyable interlude of relaxation. I'm now 
off to have a game of um, musket and rifle. It's one of my war games with Ronnie Richards, introducing him to it. Um, it might even interrupt the evening's gambling because Charlie Clark, Alan Fife, and Mick Burke and I have started up a steady poker school. I'm making perhaps a little bit more money than leaders of expeditions should at the moment. Apart from any pecuniary advantage, the monsoon walk through the dripping rhododendrons did have a serious purpose. Chris used this time to size up his fellow climbers while everyone got to know one another and acclimatized to the altitude. It was also a time for reflection, and no expedition would fail to visit the Tengbochi Monastery to pay their respects and seek a blessing. Uh, Patemba went first. He'd given each one of us a scarf, and the he walked up the steps and gave the scarf to the head lama, who then placed the scarf over Patemba's head, round his neck, and blessed him. And then I came up and he did the same thing to me, and then all the other members of the team. And then I took our um, donation, something like 2,000 rupees, and presented this to the head lama. So we should like to present you on behalf of the expedition from all the members, climbers, as well as Sherpas, these small tokens of our respect for your monastery and so on. And um, the head lama told us that we should try to avoid any arguments and fights and disputes, and if we did this, we'd have a good chance of success. On the 22nd of August, base camp was finally established at the foot of the Kumbu Icefall. This soon expanded into a small village of tents, surrounded by hundreds of boxes containing equipment and supplies. The expedition was now a full three days ahead of schedule, and to further consolidate that good fortune, Patemba, the head Sherpa, asked Chris to consecrate the base camp altar, which the Sherpas erected to bring them good luck. Sadly, it was not to last. <laughs> certainly been brought home to us just how dangerous, how savage a mountain, Mount Everest can be. Because yesterday we had our first tragedy. It was one of those cruel, bizarre, kind of completely unexpected things. Um, which just jetted like a cruel spoke into a wheel of the wheel of our expedition that seemed to be going so well up to now, so smoothly, and then this thing had to happen. What had stunned Chris was the death of Mingma, a young deaf and dumb Sherpa, nicknamed Easy Rider, who wore a motorcycle jacket styled on the recent Jack Nicholson movie. This troubled lad, who was shunned by his fellow Sherpa because of his disabilities, had become an unofficial member of the expedition. I think it's, it's very dangerous latching on to people like this because it's rather like taking on a stray dog. You can look after them and be nice to them for a short time, but you can't take full responsibility for them and then once it's over you've you've got to leave them and abandon them in the same state that they were, perhaps worse off than they were before. Anyway, the others I think were softer hearted perhaps and Doug Scott particularly, who's one of the kindest, warmest people I think I know, all mixed up in his strength and ruggedness. And Doug was very kind to the young lad, and the lad very much latched on to him. Chris now organised a search party to find Mingma, lost in a grim wasteland of icy rivers dashing through rubble-filled ravines. During the search, the BBC film crew recorded his every move, Later, in his own private audio diary, he regretted the need to appear cool and clinical in his handling of the situation. And then, at about 11 o'clock, over the air... Uh, hello, Adrian. Listening, over. Adrian Gordon reported that there was some Sherpas shouting ahead, and he'd go and see what it was. And he then reported that some clothes had been found by the side of the river. And then, a few minutes later, that the box that the lad had been carrying was found in the river and it seemed almost inevitable that the chap had been drowned. And then 
they found the body. Uh, Adrian, Roger, can you recover it safely? Over. Um, Doug Scott had been searching just behind, and he was going up. And I began calling off the search as other people came in. I decided I'd better go straight down in front of them to meet up with Doug particularly, to knowing just how upset he'd be. So I raced down. I was pretty upset myself. It was too close to what had happened to Conrad. Conrad was Chris and Wendy Bonington's firstborn son, who had drowned several years earlier, aged two and a half, in a stream swollen by a cloudburst at a friend's house near Glasgow. At the time, Chris had been 5,000 miles from home, covering an expedition to the Amazon jungle for the Sunday Telegraph. There was Doug, sitting his head in his hands on a rock, climbed down as I came to him and I just kind of held his arm and held mine. And I think I was able to give him some real reassurance. We waited for about 25 minutes beside the sad little body covered over by a blue anorak with his legs sticking out. I think Doug really did appreciate what I'd done. And he said, these expeditions you've been on, you've carried a hell of a lot, haven't you? And I suppose one has. Mingma's parents were given financial compensation, but it left a dark shadow over the 1975 Everest expedition led by Chris Bonington. I think, though, one realises the complete seriousness of the thing can't help asking oneself are these big climbs worth the loss of life I just pray to God there isn't another accident In the mid-70s, most expeditions to the major Himalayan peaks used siege tactics. Climbing Everest was a bit like putting a man on the moon. You needed tons of equipment, oxygen, food and fuel, and lots of people to put that equipment in place. As they climbed, camps would be established, like relay stations, and the start of that supply chain was base camp. This would be the jumping-off point for pushing a line of fixed ropes up the mountain, starting with the icefall a frozen cataract of titanic jumbled blocks. 112, take one. What the hell? Here comes Chris Bonington now, straight down from camp one. Sit down, yes. here's a cup of tea. I'm tired. <laughs> I think you are. These walks up anyway? to the um, to Camp One through the icefall are magnificent. We're going very, very early indeed, and the Sherpas seem to have taken to it as well. In fact, the first Sherpa party, I believe, had set out at two o'clock prompt. We set out at five past three. Um, it was a brilliant, clear, starlit night, and although the moon is only a crescent now, it was full moon a few days ago, it still gave an extraordinary light. You didn't need the head torch at all. Uh, there had been a fair amount of snow yesterday afternoon, so there's quite a lot of trail breaking to do, but at first there was the trail. Um, there were quite a few shops in front of us as we picked our way through the icefall, all ghostly, the great icy towers standing up around us. The icefall is statistically the most dangerous part of the mountain. It required much hard work, skill and cunning to minimise that danger, weaving a route with ropes, ladders and improvised bridges to cross yawning crevasses. Doesn't look too bad, is it, Alan? 
Looks okay, I think. At least it gets us away from that ready face. Anyway, I just thought we got some protection here. Yeah. On Everest, the line between life and death is often a fine one. The sponsor's representative, Mike Rhodes, nearly fell 200 feet to his death through a snow-covered crevasse. And that wasn't the only hazard. Charlie Clark and Jim Duff, the two expedition doctors, had to be constantly on the lookout for symptoms of altitude sickness, which, if untreated, can be fatal. It was Charlie's speedy diagnosis that saved the life of Keith Richardson, a blunt Yorkshireman reporting for the Times, who had upset the team with his refusal to show them his copy before filing it. His incipient pulmonary edema led to his early exit from the expedition. Okay, see you there. Meanwhile, Tomorrow the ice fall was fixed and, and Camp 1 was successfully tonight. established um, at the entrance now. to the Western Coombe on the 28th of August. Mike Cheney, base camp manager, had the important job of keeping the bar open. Hello, base. This is Mike Cheney speaking. Ready for your requirements. Over. Was that more uh, whiskey? One but whiskey. Over. Um, it came up this morning. Wait, I'll ask Adrian which pack it was in. Nick Escort Wait. had it. Nick Escort. Hello, the bottle of whiskey was with Nick Escort. With and it really, I think Escort. it brings the best out of you. I feel a strength in me that um, I somehow sometimes doubted that I had before the expedition when I went into the kind of absolute blind stage fright almost terror of this giant responsibility that I've built up for myself and yet I think I have got that strength I think that whatever happens on this expedition I think I can bear this expedition I think I can bear all the problems all the tragedies that could that I hope to God they don't happen I feel I can bear it, I've got the strength to do it, that somehow this expedition has brought out of me greater kind of strength that I ever knew, that I ever had. And I only hope that this proves the case. Chris knew that actually things were a good deal more complex than this. He knew he couldn't order his talented, bolshy, individualistic mountaineers around like a lot of fresh-faced squaddies. He likened his role to that of a rear admiral, letting his lead climbers make the tactical decisions, while he had overall command of strategy. But there were very real tensions. Due to the size of the team, Chris had decided to split the expedition into two parties during the walk-in to base camp. This had unfortunately given rise to endless speculation as to the composition of each group. Mike Thompson, anthropologist and expedition food organiser, nicknamed them the A-team and the B-team, management and workers. Mick Burke and Doug Scott, a writer and photographer living in Nottingham, reflected tensions that existed back home in the then strike-prone Britain. It's a very strong hierarchy set up here, and he is very much the leader. However much he might say he's coordinator, he is the leader. And it's just something within my nature, and I suspect Mick and one to the rest of us, that uh, there's a kind of shop floor mentality develops. Uh, them, the leaders, uh, the foremen, the bosses, and us. Um, however hard you try to suppress it, I think this comes through. <laughs> I think the trouble is, it's not so much him. We've got a very weak union, whereas uh, he's got a very strong management. <laughs> well, I mean, why should a leader, why should a bloke set himself up in such a strong position, take on so much responsibility, that... Uh, he worked himself into the ground. But as the serious business of climbing began, minds were focused on the job in hand and on the staggering beauty of their surroundings. It was here, in this awesome hanging valley called the Western Coombe, that Advanced Base Camp was established on the 2nd of September at 21,700 feet. This was the forward command hub, immediately opposite the southwest face. The summit was still over 7,000 feet above them. The the camp is quite incredibly beautiful. We've set it up slightly higher than last time on a kind of rise and going away a short distance from it tonight and you can see just the one tent and the glow of the tent surrounded by this great silent cirque of ice 
so inanimate and yet beautiful and at times very very threatening when I went and collected all the marker flags of the original route and the mist was slipping in and the face did look very very menacing indeed there's no doubt about it we're going to have to be incredibly careful I think the the risks the element of threat the threat that's lurking the whole time is, is, is very frightening an important milestone was reached on the 6th of September when Camp 3 was erected right at the foot of the southwest face proper. It was a logical choice of campsite and had been used many times before. We very quickly came to relics of the 73 Japanese expedition. They'd left a, one of their big tunnel tents there, a great mass of food and those old ice axes, um, a mass of rope. It made the job of digging much harder because it was all embedded in, in the ice and had to be removed. The ice axes and so on represented fair game in loot for the Sherpas. Um, I helped dig a bit. I must say I was quite tired. had a tin of Japanese fruit that was fully two years old and tasted perfectly all right. And by this time, by the way, there was a most appalling smell from all this decaying old Japanese food. It really was a litter heap. And as we dropped down the long slope. It was very ugly with scatterings of rubbish all the way down. But no doubt these would be blown away and covered by the snow soon enough and soon there'd be no sign of them at all. Above Camp 3, the great central gully, an immense snow funnel swept up several thousand feet to the vertical rock band, the obstacle which had stopped five previous expeditions. On the 8th of September, Camp 4 was established in the gully. Here, for the first time, they pitched the new box tents designed by deputy leader Hamish McKinnis. Immensely strong, they could be anchored onto the side of the mountain, and some were still standing when Chris returned to Everest ten years later. Thoughts turned quickly to Camp 5. Dougal Haston had spotted a perfect site at 25,500 feet, protected from avalanches by an overhanging cliff. On a wall this size, the slightest wind can send torrents of powder snow cascading down, and in the central funnel, Hamish McInnes was winded badly in a powder snow avalanche and had to retreat to Camp 2 to recover. Meanwhile, Chris was itching to get up in front to help his lead climbers, and on the 16th of September, with Ronnie Richards, he set out to establish Camp 5. It was from here, perched on a 45-degree slope, that for the next eight days, Chris would lead the expedition and direct operations on the critical rock band. A lot of snow had come down. Um, there's some wind high up and there's the most incredible spindrift avalanches pouring down. Great torrents of boiling snow, but Dougal had sighted the route well out of these, but it was most impressive. Um, I was getting tired and I let, I was on oxygen and I let Ronnie take over and he did a bit and I did a bit, he did a bit, I did a bit and it just went on and on and on. Long way up the old side of Camp 4, hell of a lot further up to the new side of Camp 5 and the <coughs> Sherpas were beginning to ask, what is getting to ask, well where is it? And I'd say it's just round the next bend, don't worry, and wasn't, but uh, it's round the next one after that. And so, the oxygen bottles sticking out of the snow miles ahead, and at last we got to Dougal's high point. But in leaving the jumble of Camp 4 behind, they'd forgotten to pack a cooking pan. A disaster at 25,000 feet, as the body needs five litres of liquid a day to survive at such high altitudes, and the only way to get it is to melt snow and ice. In the end, an old corned beef tin was pressed into service, and a sip of water was produced. But things just got worse. The ruddy radio wouldn't work. And um, I suddenly realised as leader how totally dependent you are on your radio. Lose your radio and your expedition just becomes a kind of formless, amorphous thing where people do all what they want to do and nobody knows what's happening or anything. Anyway, dear old Ronnie, you, you just couldn't have had a better person. He settled down. We're going to have another call at five o'clock. By five o'clock, he'd taken that radio completely to pieces. He'd fiddled around with it, and something had gone wrong with the switch. He managed to make it work so that with a pencil, you can make it work. It was a bit fiddly, so Ronnie operated, and I told him what to say, which of course could easily 
lead to misunderstandings. To help the body cope with the extreme altitude, bottled oxygen was used whilst climbing and sleeping. But it was a trade-off, as the metal cylinders were heavy and prone to failure. By now, Chris had decided that Doug Scott and Dougal Haston would be his first summit pair. That left the talented computer programmer from Manchester, Nick Escort, and Oldham-based painter and decorator Paul, best known as Touch Braithwaite, the immediate consolation prize of climbing the rock band, the highest cliff in the world. It was this daunting thousand-foot-high wall of black rock, the key to the southwest face, which had defeated all previous expeditions. They had all traversed rightward, searching in vain for a weakness. This time, in 1975, Chris was determined to explore a deep cleft up the left-hand side, which seemed to offer a better chance. That hunch was vindicated, but not without an epic struggle, as Chris recorded in his audio diary on the 20th of September. The actual gully itself, the chimney going up through the rock band, is one of the most incredible, impressive features that I can imagine. A kind of a Gordale scar in... Um, hundredfold magnificence, uh, not much more than 15 feet wide, steep rock on either side, and then it seems to open out higher up into a kind of amphitheatre with great piled up rock lit by sun, um, wrinkled and covered with snow. And then there's a shout of joy and excitement and pleasure from Nick. He said, we found a way out. There's a ramp. There's a ramp. I, I was really cock a hoop. I, you know, I, was, I was absolutely thrilled because this was the thing that we had been absolutely praying for and longing for because this was the real key. We knew the gully was there, but we didn't know that there was any real way out of it. And it was really on the connection between the gully and these upper snow slopes that the whole expedition had gambled. Nick started leading. It was very awkward. By this time, both Nick and Tut had run out of oxygen. I kind of half-hearted leg. I said, a bit left and look, how about using my oxygen, which they might have done, but Nick said, oh, it's too much trouble, too much trouble, it's in too much of a hurry. They didn't remember that later on. The shock of running out of oxygen and the pitch itself, and I'd have fell off. I'd got no runners for about nine feet. It was just too much. And inside, I just panicked. I just didn't know what to do. I just, I uh, um, um, and uh, thought it out. Eventually, got my sack off and got the pipes off and all the connections off and got the boolie. And Nick came up and uh, was going very, very well. He'd done about three or four hundred feet without oxygen, slowly. He came up and ran the rope out to the rock buttress. And anyway, he led this extremely hard, rather dangerous pitch. Uh, the only rope we had at this stage was seven millimeter rope, which was very thin, but he led it on doubled. Uh, he couldn't get runners in and. Um, he was chuntering away about it. He always makes quite fuss about things as Nick talks his way up things. Well, the first 20 feet or so was quite easy. Sort of, it's, what it is is an overhanging wall like this and a ramp <coughs> going across it. And then it narrowed down for, for about a space of about 20 feet into almost nothing. And the only really good hold was I could wedge my arm um, behind the sort of snow drift and you just hope that this great boss of snow would stay there because you're hanging with most of your weight on it. And I inched my way slowly up this with my arm hooked around this thing, trying to find footholds. And um, eventually I came to a place where the footholds, the, the wall below was so steep that you were right out of balance on this arm. The footholds just weren't good enough to take most of your weight. And I remember in a state of absolute desperation trying to get a peat on in. And I scrubbled some snow out from the back, holding on with this part of my arm, <laughs> scrubbling snow out with that part. Um, and I found a, a little crack about an inch wide. I wasn't going to give up because I knew if I gave up trying to do this pitch and he had done it, I'd have been <laughs> kicking myself for years. Anyway, I eventually got this thing, hammered this peat on in, and it was obviously useless. But if you pulled it just in one direction, it was safe. <coughs> so I, I managed to lean out on it a little bit, walk my feet up, and then walk my other arm in, and then walk my second arm in. Right, which was ob mm. it was obvious at the top of this, you know, rock yeah. band. And uh, it's a rock band really that stops seven other expeditions. Mm. I hope we find a way through it. I really do. Nick Escort and Tut Braithwaite had put the summit within the expedition's grasp. But Chris didn't feel his job was done until he'd personally made the carry to put the summit pair in their top camp above the rock band at 27,300 feet. And we just plodded on. You tried all kinds of things. You try camping and you 
do ten spaces and then have rest. Ten paces and have rest. You get fed up with that, do six paces and have rest. Your mind dreams and wanders and slowly it goes on. It just never seems to get closer and at last you get to the rock gully. You can only do one carry at a time there. It is the longest, most savage carry I've ever known. And last round the corner, out of the dark shadows of the gully, into the sun, and there's a welcome voice from up above says, E, come on, youth, which bid Doug calling to Mike. So that was a good sign that the camp was nearly there. And it's these moments that make Everest, or, or one of the many factors that make Everest so worthwhile. I think there's the tightness of the teamwork that we've managed to achieve, the friendships that we've managed to build, the fascination of the organization. But there's as well this mystical beauty, this mystical kind of experience in yourself that I think um, it means that when you get back, you'll certainly never be the same person again. You'll certainly never see the world again in quite the same way. And I think this whole combination of things gives an inner strength to every single person who's taken part on the expedition. Chris descended to Camp 5, leaving Doug and Dougal at Camp 6, poised for the summit. Despite his exhaustion, the leader now had to work out the subsequent summit bids, putting himself in the third attempt. This deeply alarmed expedition doctor Charlie Clark, and at seven o'clock that night in a private radio call, he pointed out to Chris that he'd been above 24,000 feet far too long. He should come down immediately to advance base, to rest and recuperate. Attention now turns to the first summit bid, and on the 23rd of September, Doug Scott and Dougal Haston spent the day fixing ropes across the snowfield above the rock band towards a gully that led to the south summit. Back down at Camp 2, nearly 7,000 feet below, all Chris could do was sit and wait. I am very, very fond of the people who are in my team, desperately anxious that they shouldn't be hurt. I can hear the Sherpas praying, and I'm sure they're praying for Doodle and Doug. My prayers go with them. They decided to climb light, taking just one oxygen cylinder each, and no sleeping bags. However, they did take a small gas stove and tent sack, which could be used for emergency shelter if they had to spend a night out. A frightening prospect. They left Camp 6 for the summit at half past three in the morning, in the bitter cold darkness, and by sunrise they had reached the end of the fixed ropes. They were now climbing up virgin ground, confident that time was on their side. Can you make the most of that, Charles? Oh, you, make, you can make the leader very clearly. You can get the occasional flash as well of... Um... Now the 24th... <coughs> September at about seven o'clock in the morning, the really vital day for the expedition. I've already been out, and there there are two tiny little dots, Dougal and Doug, high up of the rock band, just about at the end of their line of fixed ropes, and they're now pushing out into the unknown ground. And they've got one or two awkward rock steps in front of them, but they're certainly well in front of time. One of these rock steps delayed them for two hours. Then Dougal Haston's oxygen gear failed. This could have cost them their chance for the summit, but Doug Scott took it apart and unblocked a frozen pipe. Even so, a critical hour was lost. Then more delays, as the going became increasingly more difficult, and they collapsed repeatedly through a fragile crust into waist-deep snow. By now they were seriously behind schedule, and even with the southwest face behind them, they still had to climb the final ridge of the original Hillary Tensing 1953 route. Caught out at that altitude late in the day, most would have opted for a retreat. For these two, the only choice was between going straight onto the summit that evening, or waiting and continuing in the morning. Either way, they were committing themselves to running out of oxygen and spending a night out near the summit. 
In traditional British style, they brewed up a cup of tea, almost certainly an altitude record, and weighed up the odds. Back at advanced base, Chris had sensed that things had not gone to plan. It's ten past eight on the night of the twenty-fourth of September. Um, since my last recording, it was obvious that they were still going up. God knows what had delayed them. Whether it was extreme difficulty, that this seems unlikely. That any amount of wonder for the snow, and it looked quite straightforward. Or whether it was problems with their oxygen set. We'll only know when they get back down. They've got a bivouac sack. We know that they've got their down suits, but. A bivouac at um, twenty, probably maybe twenty-eight and a half thousand feet, is no joke at all, <coughs> and it's definitely getting colder now. The autumn bite is coming in. There's a bit of wind, and of course, without oxygen, it's that much more difficult to uh, withstand frostbite. <laughs> They're still a very, very tough pair, and I must say, I'm hopeful. There won't be any damage to them. What Doug and Dougal had decided to do was to continue if the snow conditions improved ahead. They did, but only marginally. They pushed on up the notoriously difficult Hillary Step, then reached a wide whaleback ridge which led more easily along the final three hundred yards to the summit. They arrived at six o'clock in the evening, hugged one another, took the obligatory photographs, and marvelled at the view. Well, I suppose we got there just at the absolute best time possible, from the point of view of seeing things.、Um, it was a bit、uh, awe-inspiring being there just before dark. Now you've got to get back somewhere to sleep. But we did see the most incredible sunset,、um, far better than any sunset I've ever seen in the mountains before. I mean, we were obviously above every other peak, and we're looking down on the sun setting through. But it seemed to set several times because there were layers of clouds that kept drifting in. And the sun had exploded behind them, and then it was casting Everest shadow right into Tibet, right past Makalu, and right into onto peaks I, I don't know the names of. And that was all purple and, and brown in Tibet, and then it was all white, going pink in in Nepal. It was just a fantastic sight. But it wasn't until an emotional reunion the following morning that their remarkable story of survival that night unfolded. Chris had had an anxious wait for the radio call, which confirmed they were safely back to Camp Six. Later in the day, they staggered all the way back down the ropes to advance space. Had a good scramble, lad. Great, lad. Well done. Well done. The incredible thing is, you look as if you've just come off kind of a. A winter weekend on Kinder Scout or something like that. I'll tell you, it's a bit trippy coming down there today. Hallucinating slightly. Oh my gosh! So we had to get a grip of ourselves on the ropes.、Mm. The snow was atrocious up there. It really was. Yeah. Even on the summit, we're breaking through. You break through up to your knee. You press to take off, and you go down again. Yeah. Crest, all right.、Uh, had it not been for the snow, we could have、mm. avoided that bivouac. Not only had they made the first ascent of the southwest face. As well as the first actual British ascent of Everest, but Doug and Dougal had also survived a night out at 28,700 feet above sea level, without oxygen, food, or water, the highest bivouac ever. It was only by scraping a snow hole and keeping one another awake by massaging their feet and hands to avoid them freezing in the minus 40 degrees of frost that they survived the night. Both hallucinated through lack of oxygen. As they drifted in and out of consciousness, and had imaginary conversations with both their own feet, and equipment manager Dave Clark, who was actually safely cocooned in his sleeping bag thousands of feet down the mountain. It was a night neither would ever forget. Dougal Haston, his voice still breaking with the strain of the bivouac, was asked whether climbing the southwest face was as hard as he'd expected.、Uh, actually, harder, because.、Um... We had some very interesting climbing above the rock band. We all expected the rock band to be difficult, but above it was、uh, extremely interesting. And、uh, once again, it was a long, very wearing climb.、And、we were very happy to reach the summit. It was a remarkable feat of survival, which showed younger mountaineers like me what was possible. Thirteen years later, I too survived an unplanned bivouac near the summit of Everest. I too shivered and hallucinated. 
but I was unable to fight off frostbite. Back in 1975, expedition doctor Charlie Clark was astounded by the quality of their survival when he checked over Doug and Dougal. Well, this hand looks fine, Doug. You've got a nasty crack on your thumb, which is just cold, but uh, the tips of your fingers are quite warm. Are they painful? No, they're just a bit sore. Um, just frosting up, isn't it, really? Yes, nothing more. Yeah. Just slip your socks off. Your snow hole obviously saved a great deal of... Digital removal. Digital removal. <laughs> it wasn't all over yet, as Chris had promised his other lead climbers a crack at the summit. The second summit party, consisting of Pete Boardman, Martin Boyson, Mick Burke and Patemba, had already departed for Camp 6 on the 25th either to rescue Doug and Dougal, or to go for the top themselves. So, for the next three days, until I get everyone down, there's this period of anticlimax. We've climbed the mountain, we've been successful, and yet everything could be ruined and destroyed by a stupid accident. And my weaker climbers are out there trying to do their thing, and I just pray that I get them down safe. But it was the progress of mountaineering cameraman Mick Burke whilst on the way up to Camp 6, that gave Chris the greatest heartache. I wanted to pull Mick back. I was worried about how slow he was going. The fact that he'd been up above 25,000 feet for nearly a week, and on all the carriers, admittedly always carrying very heavy loads, he'd always been very slow. Um, I talked to Martin Boyson yesterday on the radio at midday. Mick still hadn't come up from Camp 6. They were still short of oxygen. And even Martin was thinking of having just a threesome attempt with Patemba, Pete Boardman and himself. And I said that I definitely wanted Mick to come down now. Roger, well you can tell him, and I think this goes from Chris Rowling, that if he attempts to go with you tomorrow, he's probably lost his job with the BBC <laughs> over. Well, I'll tell him that. I cooled down a little bit and said, well, look, talk it over with Mick and phone, ring me or radio me back. I'll keep the radio open all afternoon. And about 4.30 in the afternoon, Mick radioed back and said that he'd been carrying... He said, I think you got a message for me. And I said, yes, I think it's high time you came down. I just don't think you're going fast enough for the other three who are fresh. And he said, yes, but I was carrying a very heavy load. I got two oxygen some cylinders up or something. And... In, <coughs> I then went in to Martin and said, well, look, Martin, what about it? And Martin said, well, I suppose we're all here together. We've got to go up together. And so I really had no choice but to leave it at that. If I'd ordered Mick down, he could have easily refused. And then what the heck do I do? Um, I did stress, though, the importance of keeping together. Uh, and I think I stressed that about three times. And there must be no question whatsoever of one person going back on his own. You all go to the summit together or you come back. Do you understand, Over? His assessment was correct. You can't forbid someone to climb Everest. The 26th dawned and the omens were not good. The weather had changed overnight. It was colder, with poorer visibility and with a steadily rising wind. Nonetheless, they were ready to climb the 1,700 feet to the summit by 4.30 that morning. Martin Boyson, ever impatient, was the first away, followed by Patemba and Pete Boardman. Mick Burke brought up the rear. It was this separation that would prove to be fatal. It's five past eleven on the 27th of September. Not I dreaded has happened. It's almost 100% certain that Mick Burke is dead. The day hadn't got off to a good start. Soon after leaving Camp 6, Martin Boyson lost a crampon and his oxygen set failed. Bitterly disappointed, he beat a weary retreat back to the tent to be a witness to the tragedy that unfolded. Ahead, Pete Boardman and Patemba made good progress for the top. Conditions underfoot were much better for them than they had been for Scott and Haston, and they had tracks to follow. 
Pete even glanced back and saw a distant figure he assumed was Martin or maybe the slow-moving Mick returning to Camp 6. On reaching the summit just after one o'clock, they exchanged pleasantries, ate some chocolate and mint cake, and Pete addressed the world on a miniature tape recorder. Thirty minutes later, they set off back down, only to be amazed by the lone figure of Mick Burke climbing towards them out of the mist. We met Mick fifteen minutes from the summit. He was on his way up to the summit, and no doubt reached there, um, and we were descending down towards the south summit for Temper and I. Uh, and Mick was doing some filming. He seemed very cheerful. And we arranged to meet him at the South Summit and then descend to Camp 6 together. During our descent to the South Summit, Patemba and I, after having left Mick, the weather deteriorated considerably and the wind increased. Uh, and we were moving fairly slowly because we were moving roped. We expected Mick to take o overtake us very quickly. In fact, he didn't, and we waited on the south summit until within uh, an hour, an hour and a half of darkness in a, a gathering blizzard. And then, after that time, we felt certain that he must have uh, slipped on some of the dangerous snow conditions uh, on the ridge towards the summit. Uh, and at that point, we knew that we could never survive the night out um, it had taken Doug and Dougal three hours to get to Camp 6. We had uh, a short time before darkness. We could see about five or ten feet, so we had to set off. Uh, and it's one of probably the most difficult decisions I've ever had to make. Their own survival was now in doubt. Visibility was reduced to ten feet, and their tracks had been obliterated by the spindrift, and the light was failing fast as the afternoon waned. Luck was on their side, and after losing their way, they stumbled fortuitously onto the start of the fixed ropes, which would lead them back to Camp 6 and safety. But things turned for the worse again, as they were hit by avalanche. Patemba lost a crampon, and Pete nearly fell to his death. But eventually, at 7.30 in the evening, on the very edge of exhaustion, they stumbled across the box tents at Camp 6. It then fell to Martin Boyson to radio Chris and tell him the bad news. Chris then had to tell the rest of the world. Well, uh, I'd like to endorse what Peter said. I think that if Peter had stayed, without a shadow of doubt, we'd have had three people dead now, instead of just tragically one person. And I must say, Dougal and Doug and every single one of us have just talked this over, talked this over, talked this over. The general consensus was that Mick must have fallen to his death. Probably on his return after reaching the summit in the whiteout conditions of the storm. Having been there myself, in similar circumstances, blinded by spindrift, fighting for life, I can imagine all too easily how he might have fallen through one of the huge snow cornices overhanging the immense eastern precipice of Everest. Any possibility of finding his body was squashed by a vicious 36-hour storm which kept the survivors in Camp 6 pinned down, fighting for their own lives. Chris then had the unenviable task of filming a report for the BBC television children's programme, Blue Peter, which had followed their progress throughout the expedition. This is the final Blue Peter story from Everest yeah. on the 30th yeah. of uh, September. I think it's story number three. Anyhow, it's the final story of Blue Peter, a sad little number. But before we actually leave our base camp, I should like to leave and plant this flag that we have down here as a memorial to Mick Burke in sight of the mountain which he did such a tremendous amount to help us climb. And so I should like to plant this flag in memory of a very, very dear and very close friend. Further down the mountain, conditions were deteriorating fast. Camp 1 was evacuated as it became dangerously unstable, and the continuing avalanche threat made the other camps vulnerable. Adrian Gordon, the advanced space camp manager, nearly died of exposure after being caught out in the open on the return from Camp 4. Luck was running out. 
Chris decided that enough was enough, and ordered an evacuation of the mountain. The last man came down the icefall on the 30th of September. The 1975 Everest Southwest Face Expedition was over. Thirty years later, Everest has been climbed by over a thousand people, with and without oxygen. It has been skied, snowboarded, and raced up in under nine hours. But the 1975 expedition remains a landmark, a great pioneering adventure. Tut Braithwaite, who with Nick Escort led through the rock band, achieving one of the hardest pieces of climbing ever performed at that altitude, remains proud of their feat. I think it's a, it's a, it's a milestone. The southwest face of Everest is a milestone climb um, of 30 years ago. I can think back to that trip uh, and it seems like yesterday uh, because it was such a an impact really and the people on it were such a, a good bunch of people. And Doug Scott, who with Dougal Haston became the first Briton to climb Everest, looks back with satisfaction at a job well done. Well, I think the Southwest Face 1975 expedition was a culmination of that type of trip. Um, it had all come together beautifully. Uh, we'd learned a lot of lessons personally. Chris had perfected his leadership style through Annapurna Southwest Face in 72. It was far more relaxed than previously. And, um, and we pulled it off. And we all came back as friends. And I think that's the best way of saying that it was a great expedition. Robin Ashcroft from the National Mountaineering Exhibition gives a modern assessment of this classic Himalayan climb. Let's be quite clear about this. What these guys achieved was absolutely incredible. They inspired a whole generation of mountaineers. Reinhold Messner, who went on to climb Everest without oxygen a few years later, wouldn't have even considered doing it without the example of these two. And look at the type of clothing they were wearing. I mean, it was good for the time, but Doug had left his down suit behind. It didn't fit him properly, and his sole source of insulation was this fibre pile jacket. It's the kind of thing you know, I'd wear for doing the gardening in on a, a cool afternoon. Doug Scott went on to climb scores of Himalayan peaks by spectacularly vertiginous routes, undaunted by a near miss in 1977 when he broke both his legs on the summit tower of the Ogre in northern Pakistan. Nowadays, he lives on the Scottish borders, practices Buddhism, organises philanthropic projects in Nepal, and waits for the next operation to mend his damaged legs. When the Southwest Face Expedition returned to Britain in 1975, the book, television film, lecture tours, magazine articles, book signings, and countless television and radio interviews turned many of the team into household names. The climb that had put the first Britons on top of Everest by the hardest route had caught the public imagination, much like the 1953 Everest Expedition, and more recently, Joe Simpson's Touching the Void. On his return, Chris Bonington became an establishment figure, awarded the CBE for his leadership of the expedition, and later knighted. He continued to make a highly successful living as a mountaineering writer and photographer. Climbing is a dangerous game, and three lead climbers from the 1975 expedition, Nick Escort, Dougal Haston, and Pete Boardman, died some years later in the mountains they loved. I think that there's probably a personal cost in all one's climbing, I mean, there's a personal cost, firstly, in what you put your your wife, your children through, and I never really realised just how much I put my children through it. They were very young at the time, but they were much more aware of it than I thought at the time. There's the personal cost and the loss of friends on the 75 trip, the loss of Mick Burke particularly. Chris can count himself lucky that he survived. And yet his appetite for adventure remains. He continues to climb near his home in the Lake District and regularly takes part in mountaineering expeditions around the world. His office, in the eaves of his Lakeland home, is crammed with the books and memories of a lifetime's climbing. And some of those memories are very painful. You tend not to remember, unless reminded as now, of the, the absolute agony of worry when you knew it was beginning to go terribly wrong and that you knew 
that Mick was at risk. And also, I mean, I had to take quite a lot of quite hard decisions uh, during that 75 trip. And uh, and that wasn't easy either. But I, I think the hardest thing was, yes, confronting Mick's death and then, of course, facing Beth and, and you know, describing and telling her what had happened. Some saw the southwest face climb as the culmination of a golden age. But for younger climbers like me, it was an inspiration to climb other new routes up Everest and to do them without oxygen. The 1975 route up the southwest face has only been repeated twice, and on one of those ascents, the whole team of four climbers disappeared. As far as we know, only one of them summited. Mick Burke did get to the top, but his body and camera have disappeared without trace. Only his memory remains with all who climbed with him and were touched by his special brand of humour. I think the thing with Everest is that um, it, it'd be very difficult if you didn't come on an expedition and they got up, because then you'd never know whether you would have been one of the people who got up. Whereas if you do come and you don't win the lucky prize in the raffle, at least you were there and you did buy a ticket in the raffle. But uh, if you haven't bought a ticket in the raffle, you can't win. So you've really got to come. I mean, once you've been once, you've got to come the next time.